uh, this was proof of principle magnesium 24 and uh, with stable ions. Then, of course, one wants to measure this with uh, radioactive uh, beams. And uh, we went uh, to this measurement uh, at Isolde. But it's a, I'll start from the beginning. It's a different talk, so that's my <laughs> talk. And uh, the question is nuclear moments. Why, actually? Uh, we can measure them, but what we can get out of them? We know what the nuclear moment is. We know what are the sources of nuclear magnetism orbital movement or intrinsic spin of the nucleons. We know that each of the nucleons in the nucleus contribute to the total magnetic moment of uh, the nucleus. And we know that the protons and the neutrons have considerably different G factors. We know what those G factors are in the free environment without any interactions. You see their signs are different, their values are quite different you're supposed not to have any orbital contribution from the neutrons. And, but what you measure in reality, these are effective g-factors. So first you have the spin g-factors that are reduced by a certain value. And also what you have is that the orbital g-factors, they're also modified. So what we get out of this is actually, this is the nuclear structure information. And this is what we're interested in, to get the information on the underlying uh, wave function at what we can obtain for that one from the nuclear moments. Uh, on the techniques, uh, what we want, what I would like to say is, again, talking about time differential techniques or time integral techniques, what we have is interaction between the oriented uh, nuclear spins. We have some magnetic field, we have some perturbation. What I would like to point, to point out uh, that we're talking, especially in, in these cases, for very short-lived uh, states. We're talking about picosecond states. And if you have a look just for numbers, what we need in order to observe uh, multiple rotations of those states is that uh, if you have a, a nuclear, nuclear state with 150 nanoseconds, this is typical an isomeric state, then about one tesla field is enough it's strong, but you still can get it with microscopic devices. However, if you go to the picosecond range, you need hundreds of kiloteslas. And hundreds of kiloteslas is something that you cannot do with any microscopic device. That's why you need to go to the hyperfine interactions, and there where we start playing with it. And uh, actually now to the physics of the magnesium uh, 32 and the island of inversion. This uh, has been a identified the island of inversion first with uh, transition probabilities. So back that we need both transition probabilities and G factors in order to extract the complete information on the nuclear structure side. And uh, what, uh, what we know also in the magnesium isotopes, uh, measurements that have been done throughout the years, and here the Leuven group has quite a few things that have been done there. You see that the ground states, they are well reproduced by the, by the nuclear theories, they have uh, very well-defined uh, moments, but they are not that sensitive to the uh, contributions, to some modifications in the shell structure or the wave function. In the sense, the magnetic moment is predominantly determined by a single, single nucleon, and the contributions from the core are not uh, that sensitive. Uh, they do not give such a big contribution to the magnetic moment. Uh, then, if one goes to the even even magnesium isotopes, this is what has been what is known. Actually, this is the magnesium 24, the example that you've seen before. The error bar is smaller than the point, so you do not see the error bar. Magnesium 26, a measurement that has been done at uh, ANU in Australia, you have quite good precision, different from the previous value. And then the question is how this develops further. And if you check the theory, within the SD shell, you would expect that the G factor will go higher up. If you get contributions from the PF shell, then you expect that things can go down. The question is where this would happen. And uh, initially, it was told that this can happen only from magnesium 30 on. But uh, some new calculations by uh, Otsuka-san and his group show that uh, already in magnesium 28, you may have some PF admixtures. The question is, are they still there? And what would they give us? So that's why a G factor of the magnesium 28 can give us some information 
whether the contributions from PF shell are already important at, uh, at this level. So uh, what we have done, we had the experiment done at uh, high isode. We have uh, the minimal detector array, eight uh, minimal triple cluster detectors. The difference uh, with standard Coulomb excitation experiment is that the detectors are not put at random positions. We want them around 90 degrees. There is why you have the high sensitivity from the angular correlation point of view. Of course, uh, you need a plunger device which can uh, give you the interaction, which I was talking about the time between the target and the uh, stripper foil. For the, magne for the neon case, we, get, we got up to 20 distances. So actually, this was the first use of the minimal plunger device in this experiment. And of course, you need to detect the particles and the correlations between the particle and uh, gamma rays. And uh, there you have uh, the standard uh, minimal CD detector. And some of the actors in this experiment is looking there through the, uh, through the detector. So you have an angular coverage in theta between 20 and 50 degrees. And you have a full uh, 360 degrees in phi dependence. Then, of course, this is the first experiment. Uh, you want to calibrate. So you have to confirm your system. What we have done is a test case, NEON 22, a test measurement. So. Uh, 5.5 MeV per nucleon, uh, one particle pico amp. Uh, we are not talking about particle nanoamps, but particle pico amps uh, uh, beams uh, from the Ibis rest gas. So this corresponds to about uh, 10 to the 7 particles per second. We could not go higher because this is a, a setup meant to be with radioactive beams. So you rarely go with more than 10 to the 7 particles per second. We had a five days uh, stable beam run. And uh, this is still preliminary results from the analysis. This is what we observe. So our value is, uh, first we measure only the amplitude of the G factor, but this is 0 0.44 with uh, n still not uh, extremely high accuracy. But even within this one, it is quite different from the previous stable beam measurements back in the 70s. Certainly outside of few sigmas. So uh, there are two measurements. Both of them are out. The question is, oh, this one is almost touching, practically, or almost. The question is, is there something wrong? Well, uh, how reliable are those measurements? Can we really trust? And starting with radioactive beams, maybe we have to first go and check. Well, uh, is there something wrong? Actually, the point here is that uh, if you compare uh, the G factors of NEON 20 and NEON 22, have the highest accuracy measurements have been done with recall in vacuum techniques, with uh, time dependent recall in vacuum techniques. So they have very high precision. They have been used to calibrate the transient field. So number of transient field studies have shown that at different velocities, you have the different transient field. This is something what you expect. But uh, the strength of the field is quite different between NEON 20 and NEON 22. And there is something fishy. Uh, the transient field is isotope independent. It is uh, chemical element might be dependent, but certainly not between the different isotopes. So this is already an indication that there is something fishy. And one really has to go back, revisit those cases, and have a look what is wrong. And before going to the radioactive case, you really have to do your homework, go back to some experiments that have been performed many years ago, and check the quoted uh, high uh, accuracy, whether this is just high precision or really high accuracy for that measurement. So then let's go to the real radioactive beam experiment. Magnesium 28, it's quite long-lived. You have uh, very high beam intensity. You can get. Uh, 10 to the 6, or the, in, before the, during the proposal, what we are using as numbers is a 10 to the, nope, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, OK. Uh, so what we used as numbers are 10 to the 6, or down to 5, 10 to the 5 particles per second. In reality, we could get 
up to 510 to the 6 post accelerated magnetism 28 per second, which is a huge number. We get very well pronounced uh, particle gamma correlation observed. We could measure 10 plunger distances, but uh, well, there are also some uh, tricky points, uh, points. The difficulties it's a radioactive beam. Radioactive beam of uh, 5, 10 to the 6, when you send it to your setup, this is a lot of activity. And indeed, after a few hours, we're having already the counting rate in our germanium detectors of uh, 5,000 per core. And this is after a few hours. Considering that the lifetime of this guy is 20 hours, you have to do something. If you do not do something, your detectors will be dead for days. So we had to decrease the beam intensity from the 510 to the 6 down to 110 to the 6, roughly. And uh, this is the intensity at which we have performed the experiment. Well, we are still analyzing the data, but uh, I just wanted uh, to give you an example. You saw what is the case for Neon 22, uh, where you have the oscillation. What is the level of statistics for magnesium 28? This is something which I managed to do just a few hours before leaving uh, for, for Goa. So uh, looking at the RT function, what you observe is, uh, well, you see that the error bars are considerably smaller than uh, the oscillation pattern that you may see. That's already something quite promising. This means that you have, even with this, uh, low intensity, you should have enough statistics. I would show something that is not really yet a fit, but this is kind of guiding line, or in the sense this is a uh, simulation, what one can expect. And this is a curve that you can get, maybe. Uh, this is still to come, but I would like to say that it's promising. We're working on it, it's coming, and certainly one should be able to get some high accuracy measurements for radioactive beams. And uh, then I would just like to come to the conclusions that uh, we can get uh, moments of uh, uh, first the single particle and collective states, as I mentioned at the beginning, they're sensitive to different parts of the nuclear wave function. And we need both uh, single particle states and collective in order to probe different parts of the nuclear structure. Uh, studies with Radioactive beam, post-accelerated radioactive beams, this is something very interesting, very promising. But one should be careful. They are radioactive. And uh, when you're going for high efficiency setups with high intensity beams, you have to think again. And what one needs to do is to look for the compromise of getting very high efficiency setups and very high intensity beams. Uh, so this is something that we still need to work on. And also uh, relying on uh, old, well-established measurements. Uh, maybe when we talk about measurements from 40 years ago, one should revisit them and uh, check that the things are indeed what you expect and that the, that the quoted high accuracies are indeed what one believes they are. So with this, I would like to uh, just thank the collaboration and thank you for your attention for those uh, two talks. Thank you. Thank you also for